Hello everybody. My name is Jonathan Kohler. I'm from the Fraunhofer Institute of Innovation and Systems Analysis in Germany. And I'm going to talk to you today about new models in freight transport, sustainable supply chains, the physical internet and irreducible complexity. Before I get proceed, I would lo just like to thank uh, Laurie Tavassi for inviting me to participate in the workshop and I acknowledge funding from the European Union through the STORM project of which this is part. The STORM project, Smart Freight Transport and Logistics Research Methodologies, is a review of freight transport modelling. It's supposed to screen existing trends and challenges in tra freight transport, and then go on to elaborate new analysis frameworks and models to address structural change in logistics and freight transport. It's also going to provide recommendations for research and development on new data, methods and tools. You can see the project consortium there. It's quite a small consortium for what is a medium-sized project lasting two and a half years. And we're in the early phases. What I'm going to talk about today is the first results on the needs and potentials, potential requirements for new modelling. What are the needs in freight transport? We have conducted a literature review and a first set of interviews and a survey which is still being analysed, but there are actually no big surprises. There are two main aspects, digitalisation and decarbonisation. In terms of digitalisation, everybody knows, I think, that um, the logistics market is undergoing a phase of very, very rapid um, innovation in terms of digital technologies. Digital internet-based business models are being introduced, um, not least the idea of the use of blockchain-based market structures, which can very much reduce the cost of participating in organising markets. And this, in my opinion, enables the possibility of fragmenting markets. In other words, going away from the large centralised centralized provision of logistics services and transport and a change away from uh, hub and spoke systems to more direct point to point systems. It also um, gives you the possibility potentially of actually having less fixed supply chains. You can have in poten potentially what I've called here the real-time optimization of supply chains, where vehicles and warehousing is adapted continuously in light of new information on what the current demand is. What this could mean is that there are more, more and smaller cross-docking and intermodal terminals. If they're automated, then the, some of the cost advantages with large centralized facilities um, both in ports and distribution centres can be maybe cons compensated. And the other aspect that is driving this is the continuing emphasis on reducing delivery times. The one possible end, let me put it that way, is that one uses predictive demand managers to make warehouses actually redundant. The idea there of having production according to a prediction of demand. You put the goods that you have produced into your transport system without knowing actually who is going to order it and exactly when, but you're predicting. And then as time progresses and the goods approaches a region where you think the demand is, you can then fine tune and cross dock to change the combination of goods in your vehicle to optimize its routing and take account of any last-minute last um, corrections to your predictions. The other big area, of course, is decarbonisation. This is going to bring new drivetrains and fuels with a set of issues around them. If you've got a new fuel, then you need a new fuel infrastructure. And there, there are various possibilities um, for road freight transport. There is a fundamental lack of clarity about what the new fuels might be, in my opinion. 
there is a question of might you go to hydrogen based fuel cells as opposed to batteries as opposed to catenary overhead, electrif overhead electrification. Um, the issues there are around what is your energy density of storage, what are your costs of your different infrastructure and vehicle technologies. Are you going to then have a world of synthetic fuels, synthetic hydrogen or whatever? Are you going to have a world where biofuels are being used as well? And the reason I mentioned biofuels, although it's not fashionable at the moment, is there is for me a big question of where is all the low carbon energy going to come from? And who says road freight will get it? In terms of biofuels and synthetic fuels, the aviation industry has far fewer technological alternatives in their to their current technologies, especially in propulsion systems and fuels. So they will very probably go down a route of biofuels and synthetic fuels, synthetic kerosene. And that is what you can see in the aviation industry at the moment. But that then leads to the question, OK, what's going to be left for road freight? And all the other industries who might want to start using hydrogen. So there needs to be an analysis of, at a global level, over the different sectors of what are the potential renewables and biofuel supply and demand? How might they be matched up? What sort of invest um, investment patterns are going to be required? Another issue around sustainability is what you might call a real elephant in the room, um, the issue of demand management, an almost taboo subject in logistics, in freight transport, in terms of, well, we might face a future where demand might be controlled in some way and controlled in the direction of lower growth. Current assumptions are always that uh, global freight transport grows faster than the economic, general economic growth but that might have to change. And certainly current modeling doesn't consider that usually in their scenarios. So that is another aspect that needs to change. One aspect that I want to talk about in particular, and I thank Phil Greening in particular for reminding me of this, is the issue of complex systems modeling and irreducible uncertainty. I come from the background in um, transitions thinking which considers socio-technical systems of which mobility and freight transport is one as a co-evolutionary system of lots of different components let me put it that way and i think that certainly applies to logistics and freight transport systems that you have lots of different components they are all changing and we've just talked about their dynamics in terms of the overall pattern of change with digitalization and decarbonization. So they're all changing over time. Their actors are changing over time. And what is also adding to that now is the way you represent these systems is changing because of the new issue of big data. The Internet of Things with potentially every single pallet or load having its own computerized, digitalized identification, every vehicle, and all of these millions of different elements interacting together lead you to lead to the generation of massive data sets, so-called big data. So we need to develop a really a new generation of models that can take advantage of all this new information. However, there is, in terms of the research world, an, access, uh, an issue of access, which um, is partly to do with the commercial and confidence issues and the issues of lots of different players in the logistics field wanting to have their own specialization and want to keep their own data but also um, for res the research world of the costs of accessing this data that is available on a commercial basis so the question is is this data being made available is it affordable in terms of research work um, and how, and how can you analyze it? One way around some of these problems might be to use samples of, this, of these big data sets um, and then use develop synthetic data to uh, match the distributions that you find. This is, of course, a an approximation, but might at least enable you to make a cut, first cut at what all this 
very large data sets can provide. And what this leads to then is new requirements for developing methods for policy and business strategy assessment. If you say you're going to be in a world where you cannot in detail predict what's going to happen and we don't know even know what the fuel's going to be, how can you base an in business investment strategy on a one or two simple scenarios? I don't believe you can. You've got to have a new way of dealing with all this fundamental uncertainty. This leads to the following ideas about modelling issues that we, I think, we have to address. How can you model system change in technologies and the operations and infrastructures? How can you include new business models and fragmented markets? As I've just discussed, how can you model and also communicate systemic uncertainty? Um, conventional Monte Carlo analysis is probably not feasible with big data, and it's certainly not possible to communicate this sort of information to policymakers who aren't deeply involved in modeling issues and who want relatively clear and straightforward answers. One set of questions is, are we needing moving towards a world of bigger models for big data analysis? Another set of questions is, what about policy assessment, as I've um, mentioned already? How can we influence policy making to direct system change? Given that systems are complex, you can't control them in detail. You have to try and put in place an environment that is supporting in the development in a particular direction, decarbonisation maybe. So there is a question of how you about, go about modelling that. Can we think of an expansion of modelling methods and applicable theories to address these different issues at different levels of market policy and geographical aggregation? Remembering, of course, that logistics chains at the moment are global. So you need to cover both the global world and also your local distribution networks at an urban or local level. So where has all this taken me in my thinking so far? Having thought about how you model transitions in the past, um, what I've found myself doing is trying to say, OK, given the problem that you face or the issues that you face, what are the key features that you need to represent? And I think that's quite easy to at least identify as problems. For me, the key features of transport models in the future have got to be, they've got to model dynamic processes of system change. Marginal models, for me, are, are not relevant when you're looking at the complete digitalization of logistics and the complete decarbonization of logistics. Both of these aspects fundamentally change your system. You need to be able to explicitly consider what these new digital center systems do, how they work, how they um, change the sustainable transport systems and how they develop supply chains. The other issue which I haven't talked about, but is for me is also important, is what about transport system behaviours from the various actors involved, the investment decision making, the demand, how that changes over time, and how people consider the different alternatives before them. And as I've talked a little bit about, how do we address issues around big data? You can then think of going in different ways of modelling. You can think of the Hadley Centre climate change model as one, as one example. So it's global, requires supercomputers, is very big and very comprehensive. That enables you to look at things in a global way, in a certain amount of detail, not complete detail, because the climate is also irreducibly complex. But it gives you a, global, a genuinely global view. It does have a require supercomputers to be run for months at a time to provide a single scenario. A simpler version is the integrated assessment modeling world, but they're very aggregated and simplified. Or do you have um, a need to go to more micro level modeling and using the agent based mo 
agent-based approaches that look at where individual niches can come, can come and develop and grow, where are your particular applications where the new technologies have an advantage, and issues like this, which can determine the uh, how things are taken up. In terms of what models are used for, I think you can break it down into three areas, really. There are models for understanding, including behavioural decision making. There are models for case specific policy advice, but also there are models to facilitate stakeholder processes. And I think these three types of activities often require different types of models. For stakeholder processes, a simple model is probably what you want it to be run quickly, whereas for understanding, you might need to go into the big points. That's a brief run through of the first ideas that we have about this subject. I look forward to continuing our discussions on these um, subjects in the future, and I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much.